Good morning. And welcome again to our Lord's house. We are celebrating Christ the King Sunday, where we celebrate the victory that our King won for us, the freedom that is ours, and how we want to serve and trust and honor Him. Uh, we will open with our first hymn. It is Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, 
both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. From his high and lofty throne, Jesus saw that we were lost. He came down to find us. He saw that we were hurt. He came to heal us. He saw that we were weak, and he came to give us strength. Is there any greater expression of grace? And now, Jesus Christ, the undisputed ruler of the universe, takes care of us. As we read Ezekiel 34, notice how focused God is on your welfare. Remember that Christ the King is with you, taking care of you as a shepherd cares for his sheep. For this is what the Lord God says, Here I am. I myself will seek the welfare of my flock and carefully search for them. As a shepherd searches for his flock when his sheep that were with him have been scattered, so I will search for my flock and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the settlements of the land. I will lead them into good pasture, and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and they will pasture on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will shepherd my flock. I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them with justice. Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them. My servant David will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of our Lord. And now for the reading of the gospel, let us rise. When you look at Jesus in the hands of the governor's soldiers, do you see the king of the universe going to war to free sinners from the dungeons of hell? Or does it look more like a helpless, unfortunate man suffering abuse at the hands of evil men? Jesus conquered all the forces of evil through submission, obedience, humiliation, and sacrifice. It was never about who was stronger. It was about paying a debt and reconciling sinners. God's perfect justice had to be satisfied. Our debt had to be paid. Jesus paid it. We read from the Gospel according to Matthew, his inspired eyewitness account of Jesus' life, chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him, and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, took the staff and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. 
And then they led him away to crucify him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. body the bread his blood the wine broken and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. All our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory to you, God, the light of the world, Jesus Messiah, name above all Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Messiah, Lord of all, Lord of all, Lord of all. 
Please rise. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's word we will consider together is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the 15th chapter. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. Certainly, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, when it says that all things have been put in subjection, obviously that does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, in order that God may be all in all. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, I think the most famous thing that Jesus ever did was die on the cross. I mean, we have that symbol all over the place, and in, in Sunday school classes and in uh, grade school classes uh, all over the world when you ask, what did Jesus do? He died on the cross for us. And that's a wonderful thing. It is the most amazing sacrifice ever. But it's not the end. Because Christianity isn't all about death. It's about life from death. Jesus rose from the dead. He paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. He paid the ultimate sacrifice and he died. But then he came back. And that defies logic. In first century Christianity too, there were people in Corinth who were suggesting people don't rise from the dead. And they would cite personal experience that they've never seen anybody rise from the dead. They would look at history and they'd say that there's no one in our history that's ever risen from the dead. And they would look at human logic and think that doesn't happen. They might even quote science and say, people don't rise from the dead. And the Apostle Paul said a couple of things. First he said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then in fact there is no resurrection and Christians are to be pitied more than all people because they sacrifice here. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, they sacrifice for nothing. They hope here. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, they hope in vain. But in verse 20, he says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. It is a history, it is a world-altering event that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we know a couple of things because of that. One, Jesus is no ordinary human being. Two, that our, the, the sacrifice for, or the price that we needed to be paid is paid. That we are forgiven. That we are God's people. And three, we know that we too will rise again. That there is hope. There's hope here and there's hope forever. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And I think one of the interesting uh, evidences, most interesting evidences of the, the fact of Jesus' resurrection from the dead is, are his disciples. Because you recognize there are some who suggest that the disciples all got together and said, you know what, let's say Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, the Pharisees suggested to the soldiers that they spread that rumor that the disciples just said Jesus rose from the dead so that people would believe in him. But if you think about human nature, 
What was in it for the disciples to say Jesus rose from the dead? What was in it for the disciples was persecution. What was in it for the disciples was arrest. What was in it for the disciples was execution for their faith. And if, in fact, Jesus had not risen from the dead, one of those disciples would have broken. Who would die for something they knew to be false? And yet every single one of the disciples was arrested and jailed and persecuted for that faith. And all but one of them was killed for it. But they recognized it is worth dying for because Jesus rose from the dead. So I have life here and I have life forever. In fact, Christ has been rise, raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Because Christianity is all about because Jesus lives, so do we. We live here and we live forever. Christianity is about life. It's about life for people who don't deserve it. It's about forgiveness. Forgiveness for people who, have, who are benefit, beneficiaries of the greatest sacrifice on the face of the earth. Because since, the death, since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead is also going to come by a man. Jesus came to fix what we broke. I mean, go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We recognize Adam and Eve broke God's command, severed their relationship with God, lost paradise, and gained death. And every single generation after them has carried that on. Every one of us was born as a sinner, conceived as a sinner. And every one of us has then added to that sin and made the rift wider and the wound deeper. So people can make things worse. So Jesus came to fix what we broke. And if you remember the illustration in the Old Testament, that beautiful picture that Ezekiel drew, that God himself would come and shepherd his people. He would find the lost. He would bind up the injured. He would strengthen the weak. He would take care of them and protect them and rule them with justice. That's exactly what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to fix what we constantly break. Death came by a man. And the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. Whereas in Adam they all die, so also with Christ they will all be made alive. And our gospel lesson shows the price he had to pay to make that happen. So that we could have life, he suffered bitter abuse and scorn and rejection and pain and death. And if all it were were physical and emotional abuse, that's bad enough. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But on top of that, Jesus carried the burden of our sins. And on top of that, he carried the wrath of his Father. And on top of that, he suffered the pain of God's rejection, completely cut off from any grace where he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No one on this earth has ever suffered like that. And that was the price our Savior paid for us. So in Christ we'll all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ as the first fruits, and in Christ's people it is coming. And there's two things that I think are important about this. The first one is that Christ is the first fruits. Uh, Christianity is not all about us, it's all about Him. It's about what Jesus has done for us, not what we can accomplish. Anything that we do, any good work, any blessing, anything that God does through us is out of thanks for what Jesus already accomplished. He is the first fruits. So when we look at the resurrection from the dead, we rightly look at Easter first. 
Because with Easter, on Judgment Day, we will live. Without Easter, Judgment Day is just death and condemnation. But with Easter, it's life and joy and welcome home. So Christ is the first fruits. Christianity is about life. So we look back at Easter's victory so we can look forward to ours. We know that because Christ rose from the dead, we will live forever. And then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. There are far too many people who spend their lives fearing the wrong things, serving the wrong things, and trusting the wrong things. There are many people who fear death, even though Christ has conquered it. There are many people who fear people when all they can do is affect our bodies and not our eternities and not our souls. There are many who serve themselves, even though that is a very empty dead end. There are people who trust that the things of this world will take care of them even though we recognize that the things of this world can't guarantee health, can't provide life, and can't even give peace. So Jesus is going to get rid of all those other powers and authorities. And the last one to go is death. Death is the final enemy to be done away with. Because we recognize we all have to face death. Sooner or later, we will face it. But when we recognize by faith that what we face is a defeated foe, that all death can do for a Christian is send us on home to heaven, in fact, all death can do is promote us, we don't have to face it with fear. And then on Judgment Day, our King, Christ our King, will do away with death so death isn't even a thing anymore. In heaven, there will be no more death. There will be no mourning, no crying, no pain. Because Christ our King has gotten rid of everything that causes pain. And certainly, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, when it says that all things, if you read through this, it's one of those things where, at least for me, um, when you read through this, you, you go through it, and like so often happens to the Apostle Paul, I think, wait, what? You know, because it, it says, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. So when it says all things have been put in subjection, obviously, it doesn't include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected th- to him, all things to him in order that God may be all in all doesn't even require an explanation. (laughs) When God describes what he does, when God describes his essence and his nature, we are naturally going to be confused. Paul didn't come up with this. God told Paul what to write. And so what he wrote here is absolutely true. And because it is a description of God's essence, it's going to be a little confusing. So let's work through this. The first thing he says, that he has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's a quote from the Psalms. It talks about Jesus. Jesus will rule everything for the church. That the risen, our risen Savior is now in charge and will work everything to work out for the church. And recognize what the church means. The church is not an organization. The church is God's people around word and sacrament. So God, Christ, our King, is working everything for our good. Everything has been put in subjection under his feet. Now when it says all things, it doesn't mean the one who subjected all things to him. So here's the first time when we look at how God describes himself. The one who put all things under Jesus' feet is the Father. And so when it says when when he put everything under Jesus' feet, that doesn't include God himself, which kind of makes sense. 
until you go further and he says when all things have been subjected to him the son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all God is one and yet God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit Jesus is equal to the Father as to his divinity but as to his humanity He's less than the Father. As he said, the Father is greater than I. As it says here, the Son will be sub subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. So how does that work? Well, when God describes the divinity, he's describing something that defies human logic, something that is larger than human imagination. So what we know is that when Jesus came to win the victory over sin and death and hell, he did it by submitting to his Father. He did it by undergoing humiliation. He did it by taking punishment that we deserved. So as the Christ, as the one who is anointed to be our Messiah, he won by submitting. And I think that our human nature rebels against that a little bit because I think we don't understand what submission is. We think submission, uh, or we, we're likely to think as submission as inferiority or submission as weakness. When in fact, Christ came to submit to his Father's will every single day. And when he describes for us what the perfect relationship is, what relationships are supposed to be like, it's not about domination. It is not about getting our way. It's not about making sure that we get what we want. If you remember what he said in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, when he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. A Christian relationship is about submission. Then he goes on to say, husbands and wives, this is how you will submit. You look at how Jesus lived his life. He was in submission to his Father. That's what a relationship is supposed to look like. And so Jesus, as the Christ, when he came and when he fixed the relationship between God and man, at the end, on Judgment Day, our King will then complete that submission, which is not inferiority, which is not weakness. He will complete His submission to His Father because that's what relationships are supposed to look like. It's not about getting what I want. It's about service and it's about sacrifice. So when he submits himself to his Father, that is not inferiority, that is completion, that is perfection. And he won our salvation by submission. And so the, father, the Son will be subjected to his Father because that will perfect our salvation. And our salvation is already ours. And when we look at what, our, what Christ, our King, has accomplished for us, by His submission, by His obedience, and by His sacrifice, we have forgiveness, and we have life, and we have hope, and we have peace, and we have a future forever. So when we consider Christ, our King, we remember the sacrifice that he made and the life that he took back for himself and the life that he gives to us here and forever in heaven. And we have every reason to celebrate because Christ is our King. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray.
Lord God, we ask that you would take special care of your children, the Beaumont family, and Milford Benke and Ashley Borderless, Artis Cerny, Gladys Constein, and Jerry Garbrecht, Jean Harper, Dorothy Johnson, Sally Camps, Rose Carr, Noah and Kristen Olson, Lisa Schmidt, Marjorie Urbanik, and Jesse Zag. We ask that you would protect Jesse Adams and Greg Caro and Aaron Forsberg, Dayton Godfrey, Joshua Jansen, and Jesse Johnston, Patrick Knoppenberg, Aaron Stocker, Dylan Vanko, Thomas Wyrick, Aaron Wood, Steve Campbell, Greg Hemker, Raymond Cashaw, and David Peterson. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, the, if you're following along in the bulletin, the title of the last hymn is correct, but the words in the bulletin are incorrect. The, bulletins on the, the words on the screen are correct. So we'll sing from there.
We have just a few announcements. The first one, if you still have your offering with you, you may uh, put that into the box at the head of the stairs in the entry. Uh, also, we are asking that you wait to be ushered out. We'll be ushering out from the back to the front. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to let us know what your intentions are for next week, if I could ask Dave to sit at the table again, uh, because next week is uh, not Communion Sunday. But uh, we also have services on Wednesday and Thursday this week for Thanksgiving, so it would help us prepare for those. Uh, we have three students of the week. First one, Ethan Peterson. He is in kindergarten. Uh, his family is Mason, Savannah, mom and dad, and he wants to be a Milwaukee Brewers baseball player when he grows up. Apparently no other team will do. Uh, also we have Jackson Dunce. He's in first grade. Family is mom, dad, and Aiden, and he wants to be a race car driver. And then we have Svetalina Mercer. She is in second grade at Trinity. She's more commonly known as Mango. Uh, but uh, her family is Boyana, sister Daisy, and sister Julika. And when she grows up, she wants to be a mom. Our food pantry, thank you so much for, uh, for the donations. Uh, last week, the food pantry shelves were pretty empty. Uh, this week, through your generosity and donations, there is food again that we can share with the community to show the community Jesus' love. Uh, also, Thanksgiving worship. Uh, this is the, the time of year where we set aside a day to thank God for everything that he has done and continues to do for us. So we will gather here at the Lord's house this Wednesday at 6 and Thursday at 9. So if you could let us know which of those you intend to come to, that will help us prepare for those services. Uh, we also have Bible class. We're looking at James. Uh, the book of James is one of the most hands-on, practical books of the Bible. It talks about the difference between a living and a dead faith, the place of good works, how to treat strangers, place of prayer, and more. Uh, so we'll be looking at the book of James after the service tonight downstairs, and we encourage you to join us as we grow together in faith. Uh, the Christmas tree uh, of giving will be going up again where we uh, will uh, try to bless families uh, who uh, have very little for Christmas. So if you know of a family that might be blessed by that or if you happen to be a family that would be blessed by that, please let us know. There are forms to fill out in the back or you can call the church office or just talk directly to Karen Schrank. Uh, also poinsettias for Christmas. If you'd like to provide a poinsettia to celebrate Jesus' birthday, um, the details are there. Uh, please contact the church office. We need to have those, I guess, this week. December 1st is already next week, Tuesday. So this week or else Sunday or Monday, uh, if you'd like to put a, a poinsettia here in the church. Uh, the Christmas Eve candlelight services. We are having two services on Christmas Eve. Uh, 6 and 7.30, and then a 9 o'clock on, on Christmas Day. When, again, we're asking that people sign up for those. If they do fill up beyond capacity, we will add another service. Uh, but these are the original two. The children's services from the school uh, will be on the Sunday and Monday before, both the, uh, both the Sunday morning services and the Monday evening services. Service on the 20th and the 21st will be the uh, children's Christmas services. Uh, and I guess in, in line with that, we are not going to be holding Advent services this year, and we're not going to be able to have Christmas for kids. Uh, we are going to be looking forward to Easter for kids. Uh, hopefully things will, um, it'll make it possible to have, uh, allow us to have that then. Uh, but we look forward to walking in the, in through this chaos accompanied by our King, knowing that we have life and we have peace and we have forgiveness. Mm -hmm. 